El Extraordinario. Extraordinario. The bell you're hearing is called Mukai Gane, which means welcoming bell in Japanese. Every year on August 7th, hundreds of pilgrims line up to ring it at the Rokudo Chino Ji Temple in Kyoto. This ritual marks the beginning of the Oban Festival, the Japanese version of All Souls Day. The bell is hung over a well, and legend says that its sound can be heard in the great beyond. That way, the spirits of the dead know that it's time to reunite with their relatives. This is Sima, a Turkish Sufi ceremony. You've probably seen dervishes before, those dancers that whirl around with their white skirts billowing like bells. They spin faster and faster like orbiting planets, using dance and music to go into a trance. Their right hands rise toward the sky and their left hands point toward the earth. In that state of mystic ecstasy, they become a symbol of the connection between the human and the divine. Dervish is a Persian word that literally means seeker of doors. The idea that sound and music can connect the world of the living with a higher dimension is not unique to any specific culture and can be found in myths and religions around the world. For instance, in the 12th century, German saint Hildegard von Bingen wrote in a letter, the soul is symphonic and the song of the human soul is an echo of the celestial harmony. To understand what Hildegard is talking about when she says celestial harmony, we have to go back a further 1,500 years to Pythagoras and his theory of the music of the spheres. Broadly speaking, the theory puts forward the idea that the mathematics that govern the laws of the universe can be translated into music, just as all music can be translated into numbers. If the motion of each celestial body produces a sound, then together they can create a grand celestial harmony. But if the universe produces sound, why can't we hear its music? Pythagoreans say it's because we are born and immersed in it. It's like a background noise that our brain blocks out because it's always been there. This theory survived for many centuries, all the way through to the Renaissance. The ominous music you hear now was written in 1619 by astronomer Johann Kepler in his work Harmonices Mundi. According to his calculations, this is what Mars would sound like. Over time, different philosophers added their own ideas to the theory to adapt it to their religious beliefs. At some point, it expanded beyond just celestial bodies to include the entire cosmos, from the tiniest to the largest elements. Let's go back to Abbess Hildegard von Bingen. Apart from being a saint, she was also a writer, philosopher, scientist, and composer. Hildegard said heavenly music can be found in all things, but humans lost the ability to hear it when they were cast out of Eden. The way to recover that ability is through song. Since, according to the saint, singing is a form of remembering, it allows us to reconnect with the divine and to add our voice to the celestial harmony. In her mystical ecstasies, Hildegard heard music, which she then transcribed. Although she had no classical training, she composed 78 songs that she compiled under the title Symphony of the Harmony of Celestial Revelations. This music was composed by a Swiss woman born seven centuries later, in 1877, less than 200 miles from where the abbess once lived. Here's something she wrote. This ancient land has a heart made of mountains, rivers, and lakes. 
and we have built our cities on top of them and filled them with our noise. We are deaf. But when light hits the water and when birds fly across the sky to greet me, time stands still, and I can hear something. I can hear music. I can hear the Earth's heartbeat. Ursula Bloom wrote those words at the dawn of the 20th century. She was a painter and composer, and like Hildegard, she may also have thought that she wasn't composing music. She was simply hearing it. But here I am, talking away, and I haven't even introduced myself or told you what this is all about. My name is Emma Clark. I'm a journalist, and for the last few months, I've been obsessing over Ursula Bloom and the few facts I've been able to find out about her life. But before we move on to Ursula's life, let me tell you about how I discovered her, because that's a whole other obsession. Hi, David. Um, I'm so sorry for springing this on you, but um, I'm not coming back. I know it sucks, but I've paid my part of the rent, and I'm sure you'll find someone to move in next month, right? You can get rid of the stuff that I've left behind in my room. I mean, whatever you want to do with it, it's fine. I don't care. Um, I hope you don't take this personally, but please don't text me or call me again. I'm going to disconnect this number. Well, bye. <laughs> hey, hang on, that's, that's no way to start. Let's put the voice recorder here. Uh, here? That's David, my boyfriend. He's going to be editing the sound for this podcast. We've been living together for a couple of years, and we're actually in our living room right now. I want David to walk us through a few things. When did you receive the voice message we just heard? Is that your journalist voice? <laughs> <laughs> you did say you were going to help me, right? Okay, okay, I'll focus, sorry. Um, Clara sent the message on April the 4th, 2018. And who's Clara? Well, I used to share this house with Clara and another guy called Alex. Your office used to be her room. I think she lived here for about uh, two years. Yeah, that sounds about right. Whose house is this then? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, the house is mine now because I inherited it. Back then it was my grandma's who rented it out to me. I lived here when I was at university and shared it with... Other students, Clara, Alex and I shared the place for about two years. Paul moved in when Clara left. Uh, I met you around that time. And then my grand died and left me the house. Uh, Alex and Paul moved out, I renovated it and we live here now. That's about it. Okay, so what happened after Clara messaged you? I called her the minute I heard her message, but her phone was already switched off. Alex also called her over and over again that month. Her phone was always off until one day a voice message informed us that the phone had been disconnected. She lived with you guys for two years and you never heard from her again after that? Not a word. Ever. She didn't even come back for a thing. She just vanished into thin air. What about her friends? Did they know what was going on? Well, Alex only knew one of Clara's friends, a classmate from uni. Uh, he managed to contact her, but she didn't have a clue either. We never met any of her relatives in those two years. We just knew that, that she was from Madrid and that she was studying in London. Were you worried? Sure. I mean, it was strange even by Clara's standards. It was weird of her to disappear like that. We even thought about going to the police, but what could we say? In her message, she made it clear that she was leaving the house. You said it was strange even by Clara standards. What do you mean? <laughs> well, come on, I'm not being mean. You you know me, yeah? I, I like strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Well, Clara was beyond weird. She always kept to herself and she'd been acting even stranger for the last couple of months before she left. What do you mean? She was working on her PhD. Uh, she'd finished her art history degree and was researching a Swiss painter... Ursula um, Bloom. Exactly, yep, yeah, Ursula Bloom. Two or three weeks before she called, she'd gone to Switzerland. We think that's where she called us from, but there's no way to know for sure. What do you mean she was acting weird, or weirder than usual those months? <sighs> it was her music. We were all losing our minds because of her fucking music. 
sparkling water for me, please. I already knew all the stuff you just heard about Clara. David ended up telling me about her, just not when we first met. Back then, he was living with Paul and Alex, and they never mentioned Clara. I only happened to find out about her recently. By accident, actually. This is the first time I've asked Alex about her. Well, I get why David didn't tell you about Clara. We were all in shock at first, and when that wore off, well, you know, we were pretty annoyed, especially David. Later on, when Paul moved in, we just kind of forgot about the whole situation. I mean, there wasn't that much to say about it anyway. David says you were closer to Clara than he was. Definitely. I wouldn't say they didn't get along. They just didn't click. They were on completely different wavelengths, just coexisting in the same space. And that's not my thing, as you well know. <laughs> yeah, I certainly do. I sometimes cook a meal and we'd get together for dinner. I like doing that every so often to create a sense of camaraderie. And David's grandma hired a cleaner, so we didn't need to handle the daily chores and all that. Yeah, I definitely can't picture you just sharing a space with someone and nothing else. Well, I mean, to tell you the truth, she didn't pay much attention to me and we weren't exactly friends. She always kept herself hidden away in her room. When she did need to talk to someone, she would come to me. And that's why I was upset when she sent the message to David and not to me. Although, I suppose it would have been even worse if she sent me that message out of the blue. Like, it was our landlady's grandson, after all. Is the sparkling water for you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the beer's for me. Alex is one of the nicest and most sociable people I know. It's not hard to be friends with him. So, if Clara avoided him, I guess David isn't exaggerating. She must have been a super private person. But I asked Alex about the music. Well, she'd been with us for a little over a year, and I've never heard music coming from her room before. She might have had the radio on occasionally. Like maybe she wore headphones, who knows? That noise isn't really an issue for me. Uh huh. Well, she starts working on her PhD, and all of a sudden, she's blasting this classical music. And I'm like, Have you heard of headphones? And she goes, Well, I have to listen to it like this. And on top of that, it's the same music over and over again. And get this, about a month later, she went out and bought herself a keyboard and started playing the melody herself. But it just didn't sound right. Mm, what do you mean it didn't sound right? Like, well, it sounded like she was playing it in different key, you know? I don't really have a clue about music, but... <laughs> uh, did you say something to her? Of course we did. We asked her to turn it down several times. We got her to agree to that at least, which made it slightly more bearable wasn't so much the volume as the fact that she was playing the same music obsessively. And do you remember the music? <laughs> do I ever? Like, I swear I hear that music in my dreams sometimes. I can sing it to you right now if you want to. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun. Clara Torres, I wonder if you'll ever listen to this podcast. I know you haven't published your PhD on Ursula Bloom yet because I've searched for it and nothing comes up. There's almost no information about you online, and that's quite an achievement in this day and age. I hope what I'm about to tell you doesn't bother you too much. I've seen your old Instagram account, although it's private and your last post appears just before you disappeared. Alex let me have a look at it, and I took screenshots of the few photos you posted when you were in Switzerland. I also have all of your things. Full disclosure, that's how I found out about you. David never got around to throwing them out. He didn't? Nope. Wow, I didn't see that one coming. I was so pissed off at Clara for having left us in the lurch like that. I said we should keep them just in case she came back. But he wanted to chuck them out. A year or so after she left, we sold and got rid of the bigger items like, uh, well, like the bookcases and the keyboard. But the clothes she didn't pack for the trip and the rest of her stuff, it all fit in a big old suitcase that we left lying around the house. I mean, she didn't have much. It was really bare, like like a nun's room. She did have a set of books that she was using for her research, but that's pretty much it. I can't believe the suitcase survived the renovation. I know, right? When I was getting the house ready, I thought, this has to go. I mean, I got rid of so many things and some stuff that used to belong to my gran, but... I couldn't bring myself to get rid of that suitcase. How come? I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess I thought it was like the only evidence that Alex and I have that Clara existed. Otherwise it feels like we made her up, you know? 
David's right. If I hadn't found that suitcase when I was going through the closet in the hall, I would never have found out about Clara. And even if David and Alex had told me about her, she would have been nothing but a distant blur of a person. A memory of a memory. But being able to go through her things makes Clara feel like a real person. She really didn't have much stuff, especially compared to what I would have accumulated if I'd lived in that room for two years. Just some summer clothes, a pair of sandals, some necklaces, and a couple of books. If I didn't know she was doing her PhD on an avant-garde female painter, I'd say she's into Greek and Roman art. There's a Greek and a Latin dictionary, and it looks like she only wore neutral colors. There's not a single print in sight. The things Clara left behind say a lot about her, but I'm not interested in her style or even her personality. I want to know about her obsessions. It's not uncommon to gather hundreds of papers and photocopies on a certain subject when you're working on your PhD, but the notes in the margins and the underlining were compulsive. There are four Latin words that appear several times. I've looked them up. Mortua means dead. Vixi means lived, Takui means I'm silent, or I've got a secret, and Dulce Cano, which I think is actually two words, and that means to sing sweetly. But those aren't the only words that appear frequently. This one, for instance, is a printed document about women and medieval music that mentions Hildegard von Bingen. Clara used a red pen to write Voces Dei on it, which means the voices of God in Latin. But she didn't write it just once. It's written in the margin nine times in a row. There are a lot of notes on the history of music and the theory of the harmony of the spheres. Did Ursula Bloom think that was the music she heard? I'm not sure. There's barely any information about her online. Just a handful of art blogs, but they all seem to repeat the same facts about her. Maybe Clara discovered a ton of other things, but if so, that information must have been on the computer she took with her to Switzerland. She left behind photocopies of her art books and a short summary of Ursula Bloom's life. This is all I've been able to find out about her so far. Bloom was born in 1877 in St. Gallen, a small city in Switzerland. She was the only daughter of a wealthy family who owned a textile company. She went to a Catholic boarding school that was run by nuns, and from a very young age, she showed a flair for music and painting. In 1898, she moved to Munich to study art. That's where she supposedly met another Swiss painter who was also studying there at the time and became friends with him. His name was Paul Klee. In 1911, Klee introduced her to a group of painters from Munich that called themselves the Blue Rider, led by Vasily Kandinsky. Bloom's style matches the groups. Her paintings depict Swiss landscapes using violent brushstrokes and intense colors. They could also be classed as fauvist, given the bold use of color. When World War I broke out in 1914, Ursula Bloom was in Switzerland. And even though her country was neutral, she enlisted as a nurse to help soldiers from both sides who crossed the border. Here's something weird about that period. Several biographic notes mention that Ursula used a sort of music therapy with the soldiers to help treat their PTSD. Let's take a break here. Music therapy in a field hospital during World War I? It's hard to imagine. From here on, there's a gap in her story. We have no information on Ursula Bloom's life from the end of World War I until 1920. That year, Ursula had a severe nervous breakdown and was committed to a psychiatric hospital in Geneva. And she never left. In 1923, she threw herself out of the window of her room and died. She was only 46. Maybe I should have warned you that Ursula Bloom's story was tragic, not only because of her demise, but because of how little we know about her. Like so many female artists from the early 20th century, she did not go down in history. Her art has been neglected, overshadowed by the renowned male artists of the time. It's just so unfair, considering how special her paintings are. And what about her music, you might ask? The biographical notes say she was a composer, but I can't find any recordings online. The music you hear in this podcast is David's rendition of a score written by Ursula, which Clara left behind when she disappeared. (laughs) 
if you'd asked me to play this song when Clara was living here, I would have literally cut my hands off. <laughs> Come on. It's a nice melody. Uh, it might be the first hundred times you hear it, yeah, but... We haven't been able to find the recording that Clara listened to on repeat. David says it was on a vinyl. They did find a small record player in her room, which they sold along with the keyboard. But there were no records. I think she only bought it to play that record. But I'm sure I'd remember if we'd found it. I mean, we probably would have thrown it out the window. Oh, uh, maybe not the best choice of words. Huh? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I mean, though. We'll have to cut David some slack because he's going to have to listen to this song a lot while he edits the podcast. He didn't play it by heart, although he says he could have. Several of Clara's papers have little thumbtack holes in them. David says she had a corkboard above her desk. Among the papers she's pinned up, there are some scanned and printed images of an old score handwritten by Ursula Bloom. It's the melody that Clara listened to over and over again. Another of the papers with tack marks is a printed photo of an old notebook. That's where I got the quote in German that I read earlier. It's not signed, but I'm sure it's hers because the notes on the score are written in the same handwriting. Where did Clara get those two things? Is there an entire notebook that could provide us with more information on Ursula's life in her own words? The hospital in Geneva where she spent the last years of her life is now a state-owned building that hosts cultural events. I checked the website and there's a small permanent exhibition dedicated to her. I wonder if that's where Clara found the score and the notebook. Did she take those photos when she visited or did someone send them to her? I've called and emailed the center, but I haven't heard back. And the only alternative I can think of is to go there myself. Because I want to... No. I need to know. Who was Ursula Bloom? What other music did she compose? Why did she disappear after she used music therapy on the soldiers? And what made Clara, the woman who lived in the room where I'm recording these words, become so obsessed with her? I don't know if I'll find an answer to all these questions, but if you've made it this far, I hope you'll come along for the ride. <laughs>